setting you up for a massive week ahead from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Futures fading just a little bit on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, hoping for a soft landing. This job of orchestrating a soft landing. They're trying so hard. To the Fed is late. The Fed knows it's late. They need to normalize. They need to normalize as quickly as possible. The Fed's path to this soft landing has narrowed. The Fed now has to choose between one of two mistakes. There's a risk that the Fed over tightens. There's a risk that the Fed under tightens. Go too fast or go too slow. What's worse? an under tightening this year or an over tightening. It seems unlikely that we're going to be able to avoid a harder landing. Now we're going to make a policy error trying to fix the problem that they should have tried fixing last year. The question is, is sort of when. Pass to manage a landing inflation without breaking growth is getting narrower and narrower. The big question is, does it morph into a recession? So it's certainly not an easy position for the Fed. Joining us now, Crossmark's Victoria Fernandez, Invesco's Rob Waldner, Victoria, let me begin with you. We're pricing in some weakness into this equity market beneath the surface, away from the index level, sector to sector. How elusive is that soft landing going to be? Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty tricky, Jonathan. I mean, it is this tight wire um, that they're going to have to be walking for this. And, you know, Jan Hatzius was on earlier on the network, and he was talking about a way to make this happen is that they have to diminish the demand and diminish the capex from corporations, but yet not enough to where people are, uh, companies are laying people off. I'm not sure how you actually get exactly that point because you look at PMIs and CapEx is actually above trend levels right now. That's actually a support for the economy. So I think it's going to be very difficult for the Fed to focus on just inflation. That's where their focus is right now and continue to raise rates at an increased pace. I mean, I didn't think they could get more hawkish than they were earlier in the year, but they proved me wrong and have done so lately. How they're going to accomplish that without destroying other parts of the economy. I don't see a recession in the U.S. this year, but I definitely see much slower growth. Rob Walner, your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I think uh, the Fed is on a, on a pretty good path here. I mean, it is this is tricky, but the Fed has been very clear. They need to get rates to neutral, and I think they're right in that assessment. And so they're going to do that as fast as possible. And we've now got that priced into the market. A lot of people were concerned the market would not be able to handle that. They would create a lot of volatility, but we've got the, you know, what is essentially 350s and 325s priced in over the next uh, six meetings this year. And, and the market's stable, and I think we're starting to see uh, some signs that, you know, job openings have stabilized. Um, you know, there, there's, there's some signs that what we expect might happen is that uh, economy, the economy will slow from the very high rates of growth last year, steadily slow down here. And, you know, if, if the economy can get to sort of potential-like rates of growth with, you know, 1% or 2% handle uh, by the end of this year or beginning of next year, they, they, they may be able to, to handle that. Rob, I hear this a lot, this idea that we've priced in the Fed. We might have priced in a rate hike in cycle 3%, three, 3%, three perhaps. How do you price in QT if people don't know how to price QT? Well, that's a great point, Jonathan. And I think there is some more, uh, you know, QT, the, the, the big hawkish surprise that we might get in QT, right, because we, we don't really know how this is going to work, but the big hawkish surprise could be if they start to sell assets. And, and you know, we think they may sell some mortgages, uh, they may decide to sell some treasuries. So that will put upward pressure on the on the longer end of the yield curve. But, you know, I, I don't think the Fed would be averse to having the yield curve stay steep while they raise rates. I think that they would feel like that is supportive of their mission. Look at what's been happening this going. week, though. We've had that steepness in this yield curve. Yields have picked up a bit, materially so, on a 10-year through 270. And, Victoria, what's happened, the banks haven't rallied. They've sold off. The semis have struggled. A lot of people have talked to me about that. The transport, that's in vogue, always comes up whenever they start to show some weakness. We've seen that too. The home builders through the whole year. I look ahead to the year ahead, the forward look, Victoria. You can take the recession out if you don't want to go that far. But the growth outlook, this equity market's telling us something, isn't it? Well, it is to an extent, and it's telling you that you're in the later part of this cycle. But at the same time, Jonathan, we look at the credit market, 
And the credit market is really kind of telling you a different story. We had widening in the credit market earlier in March, but look over the last couple of weeks, there's been tremendous tightening coming back, both in investment grade and in high yield. And you look at the leverage in investment grade, and that's about half of where it was two years ago. So I think you have some conflicting stories. I think you have the component that's saying, yes, the economy is strong, the consumer is good. You know, there's there's a t-shirt that says, underestimate me, that'll be fun. I feel like that's what the consumer is saying right now. So don't underestimate the strength of the consumer. You have earnings that are coming up. I think we're going to get pretty decent earnings here for the first quarter, but yet these valuation levels and the idea that we're at the late cycle is really kind of balancing against that. But I think you have two different stories coming um, when you look at part of the bond market and at the equity market. And that's why next week is so important. We get CPI on the Tuesday on the 13th, then on the 14th, bank earnings kick off. And then on the Thursday, we get an ECB rate decision on the banks with JP Morgan on deck next Wednesday. Let's bring in Kelly Lines for more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, we're just days away gearing up for another earnings season. And actually, the closer we get to JP Morgan kicking things off on Wednesday, the higher estimates largely have become when you look for the S&P 500 as a whole. Back on February 25th, you had the average analyst forecast for S&P 500 earnings at just 4.9 percent growth. That number now up at 5.7 percent, even though it is fractionally lower from where we were at the end of March. And that isn't just a pattern that holds for the first quarter. Forecasts for S&P 500 earnings growth have risen in for all four quarters of this year. Full year expectations higher since January 1st, and that doesn't often happen at the start of the year. Over the last 10 years, estimates for the complete 12 months have fallen seven times by this point in the year. And our John Authors points out that the two years before this one that saw that happen, could arguably be contributed to unusual circumstances like the swift recovery from the pandemic last year and the impact of Trump's tax reform back in 2018. So that makes this also a little bit unusual, especially that companies are facing headwinds from inflation, supply side challenges that the war in Ukraine only threatens to exacerbate. And all of that could up, add up to some serious pressure on margins. So the question once again will come down to companies' abilities to exercise that pricing power. So far, largely they have been able to do so, which is why we actually saw earnings last quarter coming in ahead of expectations. But the share of companies that beat was actually the lowest since the onset of the pandemic. So we'll see what upside surprises are able to look like this quarter, John. Kelly, thank you. As we look ahead to earnings next week, one thing we know is that Goldman traders have made a lot of money. Goldman traders made $300 million on inflation bets in the first quarter with a strong lead to what's been developing over in Europe. We'll look out for that and break that down with Shanali Basak a little bit later around the opening bell. On the year so far, Goldman struggled. It's down 18% year to date. JP Morgan is down 17% year to date. If we can bring up a bonds board just pretty quickly, let's think about this. Where we've been year to date on treasuries, on a two year, we started the year in and around 70 basis points. Look at this, 252.18. If I told you the amount of work we do at the front end of the yield curve, pricing in a big rate hiking cycle, and then told you we'd have this weakness in banks. Would you believe me? KBW but Banks Index eight. is down day after day after day after day. Victoria Fernandez, can I get your thoughts on this? Your response to the weakness we're seeing in the financials? Yeah, I'm, it's interesting that we're seeing that when we have the, the actual steepening of the curve from two to tens. You know, everyone thought the weakness, a lot of it was due to the inversion between two and tens last week. But look, banks have changed a little bit. We actually still like the financials right here. Bank of America is actually a name that we've been purchasing lately because the business model has shifted. When you look at the loans that banks have, Back in 2010, about 60% of those loans were real estate, and they were targeted to that longer end of the curve. They're not anymore. That real estate component's down in the 30 percentage points, and they're more focused on commercial and industrial loans, credit cards, autos. That's on the shorter part of the curve. So as the Fed hikes rates, net interest margins can actually go higher for banks. And I think people need to shift a little bit from the historical way that they thought about the relationship between banks and yield curves and think more short end. That doesn't explain why banks are still doing poorly. Um, I think they're, they've gone oversold a little bit here, so you have an opportunity, but it's probably more of a short-term trade at this point of the cycle than a longer-term trade. We'll see how everyone responds to the numbers next week. I was just going through the Bank of America research this morning. And what it said to me was just a lack of conviction. I spoke to someone recently who I really respect in the market, and they said that's what we've got right now, minimal conviction. They went through the client feedback they'd had, quote by quote, and here's some of the quotes. I'll share them with you. Bill Dudley, in everyone's mind right now, 
No one wants to get cocky ahead of 50 basis point hikes in QT. Can't make my mind up if it's recession or stagflation. Someone else said recession now is so consensus. Rob, can you respond to this? Just the lack of conviction and the conversations you're having in markets too. Is it a reflection of the same thing? Well, I think that the, the key thing here, Jonathan, is that the the we're very, we're in a late cycle kind of dynamic, and what's confusing about it is that the Fed is late. So the Fed we're probably the Fed is starting to get going late in the cycle. We talk a lot about that, but that does have impacts on markets. So that late cycle dynamic where growth is slowing, and and financial conditions are tightening, that's not good for uh, for asset markets overall. Um, so the underlying growth is still decent, but you know there are headwinds because growth is slowing and and policy is tightening. And the, the thing that's confusing about it this time is the Fed is late, so it's starting to raise rates much later in the cycle. So we're getting confused between the Fed and and the cycle dynamics. Futures right now negative a tenth of one percent, about 20 minutes out from the open and bound. Rob Waldner, Victoria Fernandez, sticking with us. Let's get you some movers ahead of that open. Here's Abby. Good morning, John. And yes, futures are flipping around a little bit, trying to find some direction, but down slightly. However, helping to the upside, Kroger shares are popping this on an upgrade of Bank of America to a buy. The analysts there saying consumers are accepting and paying higher prices at the market. This is the U.N. food index of prices rise to a fresh record high for the month of March, of course, as the war in Ukraine takes a toll. Also higher off of its highs, but still higher. J.P. Morgan Chase, speaking of bank earnings, up three tenths of one percent in sympathy with yields, up a little bit this morning and of course ahead of earnings next Wednesday. Robin Hood to the downside though down 5.6 percent. Goldman has downgraded the shares definitively to a sell and then Twitter on the week one of the best weeks in a while up 22 percent up for a fourth week of course on the Elon Musk effect and his 9.2 percent passive stake. Not so passive with that new board seat and next week John get this he will be meeting with the Twitter staff along with the CEO to address any concerns around culture and change as he becomes is part of the company, even whether it's passive or active. I would say more do you, active. Do you not. think that meeting might be a reflection of something he suggested earlier this week on Twitter, perhaps? Uh, Can you imagine it going that way. I, I'm the not picture. sure. No, you didn't see that. Oh, oh, in terms of the Rogan podcast, yes. Well, that would be a I concern for some I people. I don't imagine they... that's going to going to be how they carry out that board meeting. Probably not. I would it's... imagine it'll be more straightforward and professional. Abby, thank you. We'll try and stay professional. Coming up on the programme, Western allies ramping up the pressure on Russia. Allies uh, uh, should do more and are ready to do more to provide more equipment and they uh, realise and, and, and recognise the urgency. That conversation, up next. It was a clear message from the meeting today that allies uh, uh, should do more and are ready to do more to provide more equipment and they uh, realise and, and, and recognise the urgency. Be prepared for a long haul. This war may uh, last for uh, weeks but also months and uh, uh, possibly also for years. The EU issuing a fifth round of Russian sanctions, a first step in targeting Moscow's vast energy revenues, including a ban on Russian coal imports and restricting Russian trucks and ships from entering the EU. I want to get over to Amory Hordern down in D.C. AMH, let's start there. The breakthrough this week. How much of a breakthrough is this? Well, it is a breakthrough because it's cracking that ceiling of energy, which, Jonathan, for a while, really, you couldn't even get a European official to want to discuss any part of the energy spectrum with you about if they would ever go after it. But obviously, coal is a lot less important than the likes of oil, natural gas. But the Polish ambassador says the EU is going to be drafting up plans to target that next. Go after oil, go after natural gas, and also nuclear fuel coming from Russia. The issue is going to be, can you get every single European Union member to join on board with that. That is going to be tough. Are we satisfied with the results? And by we, I mean European allies and the U.S. administration. Are they satisfied with the results of what they're seeing so far based on the sanctions they've implemented? Well, I think the fact that they are starting to now dig into the energy portfolio says a lot. And I think the United States recognizes, though, the position Europe is in. Europe cannot tomorrow, overnight, turn off the taps from Russia. It is just not possible unless they want to have demand destruction and tell 
individuals in Europe, you can no longer drive. You have to shut off your heat, etc. I would also notice, Jonathan, this morning when I came in, a massive policy shift coming out of Tokyo. The prime minister of Japan is saying we will also ban Russian coal. Now, they drew a very hard line saying we can never go into import, uh, banning any imports from Russia, because Japan is so, so reliant on imports uh, of all energy spaces. And now they are even saying that they want to work in lockstep with the United States and the European Union. Just to pick up on a market move just quickly, dollar index DXY with a 100 handle. It's been a while. DXY with a 100 handle. We take the broader Bloomberg dollar index and that is at the strongest level going back to July 2020. The DXY, the dollar index, more heavily weighted of course towards the single currency. But there it is, a 100 on the dollar index. MH, just to come back to you just quickly, the objectives of this war for the Russians to demilitarize the country, one, to change the leadership, two. They were the top two objectives for the Russian government. Have they changed now? Well, we should note that those top two objectives, uh, the Russians actually made Ukrainians more obsessed with uh, President Zelensky. There's a really nationalistic feel in Ukraine. And at the second time, now you have more weapons than ever before from Ukrainian allies filtering into Ukraine. The objective now, Jonathan, has clearly changed to what we're hearing on the ground and officials have made pretty public. And also what you can see is that Russia is going to now target eastern and southern Ukraine. They were not able to capture Kiev. So now they're going to try to make that stronghold in the east. And what we have today is Ukrainian officials talking about in these images of bombing of a train station as hundreds and thousands potentially were trying to evacuate the Donetsk area because they know that that's where Russia is going to be targeting. AMH, thank you. Down in D.C. Just to return to the price action just briefly. Yield tower again at the front end. Stateside on a two-year Treasury yield, 252. Broke through 270 on a 10-year this morning, up another six basis points. So let's call it 272. Off the back of this, a stronger dollar in the mix. The broader-weighted Bloomberg dollar index, the strongest since the summer of 2020. Got to go back to spring 2020. May 2020, to be precise, to see the dollar index where it is right now. The DXY, to be specific, with a 100 handle. I'll touch on that a little bit later. To return to energy, those stocks absolutely ripping this year. Year today up by almost 40%. Should you stick with it? This is the view from B of A. Stick with energy. I know it sounds crazy. Energy is still a massive underweight, but the sector has basically doubled in its size in the benchmark. Still offers a very high free cash flow, real free cash flow relative to other sectors. Um, the free the the earnings have kept up with its price moves. I think energy is now finally investable again, but folks haven't necessarily moved into the sector as aggressively as we would have expected. Victoria, those names have absolutely ripped. Would you stick with them? You know, we were actually underweight energy for most of last year, Jonathan, which did not work out well for us. And we actually wish we had more in our portfolio so we could be trimming some of those names. But we are adding a little bit just to bring that weight up. Savita talked about how the energy component has doubled in the index. So we need to bring up our weight a little bit. So as we look at some of those names, Philip 66 is a name that we've been purchasing lately. And I think we have to be um, watching very carefully. I know they think that will have demand destruction when it comes to energy because of higher gas prices, and then that's going to flow through to stock prices. But if we are releasing reserves and bringing gas prices down, we really don't see how that's going to make demand go lower. We think we're going to continue to see demand. So it makes sense to us that you have some exposure to energy as we go through the next few quarters, especially if the Russia-Ukraine war continues longer than what people are anticipating, the pressure is going to remain. Uh, Victoria, the pressure is coming from Washington, D.C. as well. I just wonder how you think they're going to respond in Q1, in earnings season, how they're going to deliver their outlook, reflect on the earnings they've had when you know the earnings they have that is going to be a very delicate story in Washington. It really is. And we already had Shell come out and talk about the write-off that they're going to have. I think they're saying $5 billion, if I remember the number correctly, um, that they mentioned. And they're not going to be the only ones, right? I think these companies are going to come out during earnings season and remind us of the struggles that they had previously. I think there's going to be a debate around do they – put in the capex, do they put in the time and the effort and hire the people to drill more if things are going to pull back, if demand is going to slow down. There's going to be a big story coming out of the energy companies during earnings and it's going to be very important to watch. I imagine they'll compare Q1 2022 to Q1 2020 to Absolutely. just help us understand where they've been. <laughs>
where they were a few years ago. Rob Waldner, at some point, people believe that the things that are helping these names hurt these names. Energy prices specifically start to hit the cycle. Are you one of those that worries about that? Well, I think you would need to see you need to see higher prices than where we are now. I mean, if you go back and look at where you really get demand destruction, it's not at one hundred dollars a barrel. It's well above that. And so, if you just continue to see uh, what we're seeing, which is which is uh, these higher prices, you know, we think that the energy sector is probably under underpriced for where energy currently is. And particularly, if you can get up the back months um, and really start to get capital flowing to the sector, which has really been a a uh, Capitalists steered well away from the sector for quite a while. You know, you should be able to get continued uh, good performance there. Final word on high yield, Rob. Do you like what you see? Have you had a backup in yields that you'd like to buy? Is it sufficient enough? Yeah. So you know, high yield yields are back up close about six percent or a little bit above six percent. Um, and if you accept kind of what we think, which is the Fed will raise rates, but uh, you know, we they 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 turn they they get somewhere around three percent by the middle of next year. Um, and the economy is still decent, even if we're in late cycle, the economy still has decent growth. The fundamentals behind high yield should remain solid. Um, so, you know, it starts to look interesting at, at, at 6 percent. Rob Wagner, Victoria Fernandez, to both of you, thank you. Going into the opening bell this morning. Coming up on the programme, the morning calls and later. Higher rates doing very little for the big banks. What is going on here just ahead of earnings season with the banks on the longest losing streak? since 2018 on the KBW Banks Index. More on that still to come from New York with futures down a tenth of 1% on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening battle in New York this morning. Good morning to you all. We are slightly negative on the S&P, down again on the Nasdaq and down on the week as well, pretty hard on the Nasdaq 100. We're down four tenths of one percent, up pretty hard on a 10 year yield this week. Check out this in the bond market, a 10 year Treasury this week up by more than 30 percent, 30 basis points to be precise, up right now to 271.52. And even with that, the banks aren't performing. The curve's steeper this week. It's not flatter. I'll pick up on that in a moment. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. First up, Credit Suisse downgrading Alcoa to neutral, expecting inflationary pressures to continue with aluminum prices peaking. Next up, B of A downgrading nine different stocks within their transportation coverage, pointing to softer demand and rapidly falling freight prices. And finally, Gordon Haskett upgrading Target to buy, saying sentiment on the retailers looks too negative, with channel checks showing signs of strength. Coming up, surging bond yields, not enough to support the big banks. Seven days of losses on the KBW Banks Index, the longest losing streak going back to late 2018. Up next on this, JP Morgan's David Leibovitz on the earnings season right around the corner. Four seconds away from the opening bow this morning and good morning. Closing out this week and looking ahead to next week already with earnings season just around the corner. CPI next week, the estimate so far in our survey, 8.4% is the median estimate. Got into the opening bow futures just a little bit negative on the S&P, down a little more than a tenth of 1%. There's the opening bow, switch up the board and get to the bond market. What a move we've seen on a 10-year yield, up by more than 30 basis points on a 10-year this week. So 171. Yield tie this morning by another five basis points. The dollar showing some strength. The dollar index climbing to a 100 handle on the DXY. Euro dollar negative a third of 1%, just about hanging on to 108 going into the first round of the French election this Sunday. Euro dollar 108.41. Brent crude positive. WTI just about by a third of 1%, 96.38. We're just about clinging on to 96 right now as well. Looking at the open about 30 seconds in, we advance on energy stocks by five or six tenths of 1%. Information technology a little softer, lighter, lower, negative six tenths of 1%. That's where your underperformance is on the session this Friday so far. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. John, let's take a look at some of the outperformance, starting out with the shares of Kroger. They are popping on an upgrade to buy at B of A. The analysts there are saying that consumers are accepting and digesting higher prices at the market, paying those prices. This as a U.N. food index of prices has rise to a fresh record high. And that's one reason that 
Archer Daniels Midland is also higher, up 1% plus grains themselves higher. Spirit Airlines up about 7 tenths of 1% as the company agrees to entertain takeover talks from JetBlue and its unsolicited $3.6 billion bid. And then finally, this is interesting, CrowdStrike, the cyber defense company popping as a new Department of Defense contract uh, has been accepted and the company has boosted guidance. It, of course, is a technology company to some degree, John. One tech company not being pressed by these rising yields. Abby, thank you. About a minute in, breaking news, the banks, drum roll, they're positive, just by a third of 1% on the KBW Banks Index. Before today, seven straight days of losses, the longest daily losing streak going back all the way to Q4 2018. Do you remember that? The back end of 2018 is when the Fed had to back away in a massive way. Goldman this morning still negative by two tenths of 1%. JP Morgan positive though by a third of 1% going into earnings season next week. Let's get to Bloomberg's Shanali Basak for more. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. Really, there's a lot of red on the screen when you look at the big banks. All of the big five are down more than 10 percent on the year, some more than others. You have Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan down 17 percent on the year. And it's easy to see why when you look at Wall Street's expectations of what the quarter will look like. So you have trading performance that's expected to be down across the big banks, especially in FIC trading. If you take a look at the screen, there are J.P. Morgan FIC expectations down 20 percent. Goldman expectations on 21 percent. You have to wonder how much that will be true because there are some very interesting gains in those businesses. If you take a look at Bloomberg Scoop today on the commod and the inflation bet for Goldman, $300 million in the first quarter alone. If you take a look at the nickel trade they made, there's going to be a lot of questions around whether they will have been able to make money on that as well. And Citigroup also big commodities exposure questions around whether they were able to kind of keep steady deal making also take a look John on how much lower expectations are what my sources are telling me is that people are prolonging deal making so September is around the time people expect some of those deals to come back so even in a bit of bad quarter you're going to hear those bankers keeping that uh, positive outlook later on in the year you are always my go-to correspondent whenever it's earnings season for the banks next week will be no different Shanali you listen to the calls on the calls last time around one dominant focus was spending and what you'd get in return for that spending. This time around, Tom Keane this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance mentioned something interesting. He wondered whether this was going to be about discipline and cost discipline, because the story over the last three months has become much, much more about inflation and cost inflation. Yeah, listen, pay for performance. That's what they've said all along. We knew that they had levers to pull here when it came to pay, at least according to their talent bases here. When we talked to Tom DiNapoli, the comptroller of New York, he already expected that pay would be lower for the bankers this year as opposed to last year. But remember, there are some costs you cannot change here. There's also, John, I just want to mention really quickly the loan picture here. The loans have been growing much more than expected, so that could be a positive sign. You'll hear from analysts, however, on on what the credit underwriting looks like and whether we're going to start people uh, preparing a little bit more for a potential recession next year and uh, worry about write downs in the future. Shanali, awesome. Looking ahead to next week. Looking forward to it. JP Morgan coming out later next week, April 13th to be precise. Looking ahead to earnings season, Biggie Chatter at Deutsche Bank said this, the consensus expects earnings growth in Q1 to decelerate sharply on a year-over-year -year basis and to fall slightly on a sequential basis adjusted for seasonality. However, a variety of drivers point to continued solid sequential earnings growth in Q1 and we look for slightly above average beats on the earnings season and a whole lot more. I'm pleased to say that joining us now is JP Morgan's David Leibovitz. David, let's start there on earnings. Do you agree with the Deutsche view, the more optimistic, constructive view about the outlook for earnings? I, I do think that that's right. You know, at the end of the day, when we think about the outlook for corporate profits, it's much more about the nominal growth story uh, than it is about the real growth story. And we, we know that economic activity in a, on a real basis was a bit sluggish during the first quarter, but, but inflation uh, is obviously quite elevated. And so you're seeing that companies have pricing power, which is something that didn't exist in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And so I do think that there's upside risk uh, around current estimates. You know, to me, the question about the full year is really going to hinge on margins and you were you were kind of flirting with the topic 
in the context of the financials, um, some input costs can be passed along very easily. Uh, others, like wages, it's more difficult to do that. And so I really think that, again, the margin story is going to be the key determinant of the way that earnings shake out for 2022 as a whole. How are you thinking about the FX story, too? And forgive me for bringing that up prematurely in this conversation, but just a series of headlines dropping again, David, in the meantime. We've got a low on the session on cable of 129.99, so it's a break of 130 for the first time in quite a while on pound sterling, the first time since November 2020. Earlier on this morning, about 15 minutes ago, we had the dollar index with a 100 handle. The Bloomberg dollar index, the strongest since summer of two years ago as well. How does that influence your thoughts about where you position in the equity market globally? So the, the dollar story has been interesting here because usually if you look at the way the dollar behaves going into periods of Fed tightening, uh, it's very much an, an example of buying the rumor and selling the news. Usually you see the dollar strengthen going into the first rate hike uh, and then sell off in the aftermath. Obviously, that's not the way things are playing out this time around. I think the general risk off tone uh, in markets is, is contributing to some of this dollar strength in addition to widening. widening uh, interest rate differentials. But, you know, in general, we think that the dollar is too expensive. I think that the dollar is taking its cues uh, from two things, you know, expectations for global growth this year and what's going on with the pandemic. And you look at what's going on in China, you look at what's going down, going on in Europe and the risk of higher energy prices there. And, and it makes sense that the dollar is strengthening. And so it does make us a little bit more cautious about those big global names. Uh, but again, I think that this is probably temporary and wouldn't be surprised to see the dollar begin to weaken during the second half. Uh, particularly if we're able to move past some of the uh, some of the current headwinds. And that's because you've got a much more constructive view about the cycle. I get it. If you've got that, you'd fade this dollar move. But this is happening in the equity market too, David. I was talking to guests, two guests earlier this morning, Victoria Fernandez and Rob Waldner. Within the equity market, as you can see, yields are higher. Banks aren't responding to it. Home builders are suffering because interest rates are high, but also because some people are worried about this cycle rolling over. You see it in the transports as well with the downgrade we had from Bank of America earlier this morning. And I'm wondering how you're suggesting to clients how to manage cyclicality at the moment, David. What are you telling them? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think if we go back to the beginning of this year, the, the biggest risk on our radar was that the Fed was going to overdo it uh, and end up ending the expansion at some point in 2023. Uh, a quarter of a way through the year, the biggest risk on our radar is still that the Fed overdoes it uh, and causes a recession next year. Uh, what we've been saying to clients about managing that cyclicality, when we look at portfolios, one of the things that we've noticed is that over the past couple of years, clients have become very, very overweight growth. Uh, and as a result of that, underweight value. And so a lot of the conversations aren't about going crazy and, and you know, leaning into cyclicals uh, in an aggressive way, but rather bringing those portfolios back to balance. And, and what I would say is that even within the cyclicals, right, our outlook for, for parts of the industrial complex, for parts of the material complex, very different uh, than that, the outlook for, for things like financials, which are obviously struggling uh, both from a trading as well as a fundamental perspective. And so when it comes to having enough cyclicality in portfolios, that's really to us what's most important. We're not saying that people should overdo it, sure. but rather ensure that they have enough exposure that they can participate uh, if consensus ends up being wrong about where the, uh, where the economy is. Well, heading. I'm wondering what consensus is and is it sufficient to avoid a recession? Is that sufficient for cyclicals to start doing something for me again? And David, that depends on what you think we're pricing here. Are we pricing a recession or are we just pricing a slowdown? Which one do you think it is? So I, I think that the equity market is, is still just pricing a slowdown. I think that what, to me, the most important thing to watch is, is what happens at these next couple of Fed meetings. Because at the end of the day, all of the volatility that we're seeing across capital markets comes back to one central issue, and that's uncertainty about what the Fed is going to do. That's driven interest rate volatility higher. That's driven FX, equity, so on and so forth, volatility higher across the board. And so to me, markets are still pricing in a slowdown today. But if we begin to see the Fed get uncomfortable, that's where I think recession risk then starts to get priced in uh, a little bit more aggressively. Again, if the Fed looks like they're willing to sacrifice the expansion uh, for the sake of getting the inflation genie back into the bottle, that's when we're going to take a more risk off tone in portfolios. Hey, David, I wonder if this is a lose lose situation. And I know some people are gripped by that at the moment. In the previous cycle in that bull market, this Federal Reserve stepped in when growth got weaker and they could do that because inflation was low. And when growth got better, they didn't have to do as much and that supported earnings. This time around, there's a belief that if things get worse, then things are bad. And if things get better, then the Fed needs to do more. And that's what Jan Hatzius of Goldman said this morning. If growth doesn't decelerate, if it does not decelerate later this year in the way that Goldman anticipates, they're talking up a Fed funds rate of north to 4%. And I'll go back to a Bank of America 
research piece this morning and the client feedback they got, and this one line that stuck out in client feedback, Bill Dudley in everyone's mind right now. Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president this week, wrote an op-ed on Bloomberg Opinion, David, and he suggested this Fed needed to get equities down. That was the objective. They need to get stocks down. And David, if that's the objective, is this a lose-lose situation for the equity investor? So I, I think that if the objective is to get stocks down, then yes, inherently it's it's a lose lose for for the equity investor. But you know, I, I think that there's something very important to, to recognize here, and it does feel like we're in an environment of peak hawkishness. Um, the Fed is going to respond to the data as it comes through the door, and you know, when we take a step back and think about what the Fed is trying to do here, their job is almost impossible because all of this inflation is coming from the supply side. You know, hiking interest rates doesn't fix the supply chain, and so you know the. Fed, to, to quote a very famous band, needs a little bit of help from its friends, right? It needs the private sector to engage here a little bit more, the private sector to begin to heal. If the private sector can get better and the Fed is raising rates, to me, that's how you end up with the ever elusive soft landing. But if you don't see things begin to heal from a supply side perspective, then it's going to be very challenging for the Fed to thread this needle. And so, again, we're watching what goes on uh, on the private side to really gauge how the Fed is going to respond and the potential for this cycle to either extend or end uh, at some point in 2023. David, thank you. It's that binary at the moment, isn't it? David Leibovitz, thank you very much. Your equity market's down and down hard at the moment. The Nasdaq off by one full percentage point. The S&P still doing OK, negative four tenths of one percent. Can we bring up the bonds board again and just look at twos, tens and thirties? This move in tens this week through 270, up another five basis points, up around 30 on the week. We started this week talking about curve invasion. You've got some steepness again, about 19 basis points or so, twos out to tens. And we've been talking about that, haven't we? Yields are up, the curve is steeper. Banks have done nothing for us the whole of this week. What does that tell you going into earnings season next week? Coming up, DC grappling with a fresh wave of COVID cases. COVID is not over, uh, and we have an obligation to protect our country, the American people, and make sure we're taking steps to prepare. That conversation, up next. We know BA2 is here. We know that it is more transmissible. We know that it is uh, leading to increased cases, and we know we're already seeing an impact on our resources. COVID is not over. Uh, and we have an obligation to protect our country, the American people, and make sure we're taking steps to prepare. Speaker Pelosi, testing positive after spending time with President Biden, the White House statement reading as follows, quote, the president is not considered a close contact of Speaker Pelosi as defined by the CDC. The president saw Speaker Pelosi at White House events and had brief interactions over the course of the last two days. And Marie, joins us down in D.C. Amory, can you help us understand this? I mean, we've seen the pictures. She spent time with the president. There was a kiss on the cheek and not a close contact. What is the CDC guidance? And the reason I ask this, and I think it's important, we're all going through this again. Corporations around the country are getting cases after cases after cases. They're all spiking. We all know someone that's got COVID again. How are we meant to manage this? Well, it's a good question, Jonathan, because now everyone is vaccinated, boosted. The White House saying the president is double boosted. He got a second booster last week. So they view this as a very different scenario than, say, where we were last year and the prior year, obviously. But Speaker Pelosi was at the White House twice this week. We saw the kiss on the cheek. They embraced. Um, what the White House is saying, though, is because he didn't spend a cumulative 15 minutes within six feet of the speaker over 24 hours. Now, I think there are some who would view the CDC guidelines a little bit differently, um, but the White House says it is technically not a close contact. Uh, but obviously, this is something that is concerning because it's not just Speaker Pelosi either, Jonathan. It's really ripping through Washington, D.C. right now. A number of lawmakers and also cabinet members are infected. Looking at the situation with Speaker Pelosi, the other issue as well, Amory, is that she did have a scheduled trip, a congressional mission over to Asia, and there was a lot of reporting about perhaps going to Taiwan. The foreign minister of China had this to say, and let's just say they didn't hold back. If the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives knowingly commits a sneaky visit to Taiwan, it will be a malicious provocation, provocation to China's sovereignty, gross interference in its internal affairs, and an extremely dangerous political signal to the outside world. What's happening here? 
Well, this is based off foreign news reports, right? We do know that she had this trip planned to Asia, and obviously now that uh, the Speaker Pelosi does have COVID, that that trip is going to be canceled or potentially postponed. Uh, so she was leading this congressional delegation abroad, and what the foreign news reports were that she was going to Taiwan. Now, the, her, her office was not able to confirm that with us. So it's interesting that the Chinese foreign ministry used the word sneaky trip. Um, but this would... China would view this, as the foreign minister said, as a provocation, because this would be a individual that's in line also to the presidency, very close to the president, speaker of the House, same party as the sitting president, making a trip to Taiwan, which China views as uh, the U.S. going against the one China policy. I'm going to get to Mike McKee and bring him into the conversation as well. Anne-Marie, thank you so much for that. Mike, let's talk about how some of these stories start to link together. COVID cases, China, the situation in Shanghai, what this all means for the growth outlook and how hard that's been hit, Mike, in the last few weeks. It's been hit pretty, uh, pretty hard. Uh, we're looking at uh, surveys from the uh, Bloomberg Survey of Economists uh, show inflation rising even more significantly by the end of the year. And that's just pushing people to push the Fed to do more, which then has a spillover impact on the rest of the world. And a lot of this coming from still COVID and the supply chain problems coming out of China. Mike, the other issue we need to talk about is this Friday. Going into the weekend, on Sunday, we've got another election. It's round one of the French election. Can you help me understand just exactly what's going on here? Well, let's set the table here. Uh, Monsieur le Président is in trouble. Uh, Macron is only three and a half percentage points ahead of his uh, chief rival, Marine Le Pen. There are a lot of candidates, as you can tell, but those two are considered all the true bets to make it to a runoff rematch of the last election. And their polls show Macron only has a five and a half percentage point lead. So there is growing fear that he might lose. He entered the race late. He spent a lot of time mediating between Russia and Ukraine, and it turns out the voters did not care. Actually, what the voters are saying, as they say in the United States and everywhere, c'est l'économie, stupide. It's the economy, stupid. Inflation in France at the highest since the Eurozone was formed. Le Pen touring towns and villages saying that Macron is out of touch. He's uh, not uh, the president of everyone. He's the president of the rich, and she's defending the little ones. She's pledging to sl slash gasoline prices and tax big energy companies. This is not going over well in markets. The CAC 40 struggling. The spread between French bun uh, oats and uh, German buns has widened significantly. So we will see what happens on Sunday. The concern is uh, Le Pen, of course, she's a far-right nativist, would put at risk the economic reforms that Macron has tried to put in place and splinter European unity over a whole lot of issues, especially Ukraine. Mike McKee, thank you, buddy, as always. Do you want to do that again for us just one more time? <laughs> L'économie. I mean, that was beautiful. Yeah. That's going to work. We should put that in the promo for yeah. Sunday's coverage. L'économie stupide. Looking forward to Sunday's coverage with Francine Lacroix. She'll take you through that. Later on this weekend, looking forward to this weekend too, the Masters, Man City, Liverpool, the Australian Grand Prix. Mike McKee, there's a lot of sport coming up. I'm excited about it. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, I do know a little bit of French, but I certainly cannot compete with Mike McKee on that. Maybe next Friday, sectors in French. But right now, we do have uh, more sectors higher, interestingly, with the S&P 500 down by about half a percent. Energy leading the way up with oil up just a little bit. Financials finally getting a boost with yields higher. To the downside, though, that is where the big weakness is and those mega weight uh, tech sectors, communication services, discretionary tech, they are way and therefore you have the S&P 500 down on the day and down on the week. And this is an interesting one, John, and it's not going to be surprising to you based on your conversations all week. But the worst four sectors or among the worst four sectors for the S&P 500, communication services, despite Twitter's big rally, uh, discretionary and tech, but you have the banks right in there. So it's an interesting mix for sure. Picking up today, at least, the financials up four tenths. And Abby, thank you for that. Looking ahead to next week with bank earnings season just around the corner. Looking ahead to the European elections, the French election to be precise, and what that means for the euro, given what's happening with the dollar this morning. Looking forward to Guy Johnson's coverage. That will kick off in about seven minutes' time on Bloomberg TV. Up next, we'll bring you the trading diary. Looking ahead to the road into the weekend and coming out the other side into next week with three big events on the horizon. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.
26 minutes into the session. This equity market's trading lower by a half of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down by 1.4 with yields kicking higher in a big way once again and looking ahead to a big week ahead. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. Some data at the top of the hour. Wholesale inventories. Then looking to next week. Fed speak. Bostick. Boss, Bowman. Waller. Evans. All on Monday. CPI Tuesday. JP Morgan earnings on Wednesday. Wells Fargo and Morgan Stanley on Thursday. Followed by an ECB rate decision and initial jobless claims as well. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. I'll be off next week if I catch you later on Bloomberg Real Yield. Looking forward to it. Otherwise, enjoy your weekend. From New York, this is Bloomberg.